I don't believe in fairies and then clap. Okay. Alright, so this will eventually saying. this will eventually go on <laughs> like the internet. Like opener for a lot of rainy night shows. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. so this will eventually go on the internet and we want people to think that we're awesome. Okay. So when I say I don't believe in fairies, then we Let's have to start. resurrect the fairy that I just killed. Oh. So we have to- Murder! You know, like, you oh, like watch like Tinkerbell and yeah, bring back exactly. Yeah, exactly! Yes, okay. So, five, four, three, two, one. I don't believe in fairies! Yes. Awesome. The best time to write is... No. The best place to write is... Here. Yeah. The best person to write is... You. you. Thank you, everyone. Everyone. Thank you all for coming to Writing Night's Meat Grinder Fundraiser. Part 1. Max Bax. Cleveland Heights, Ohio. 7-11-17. I'm Azrael Johnson. I am the founder slash director of Writing Nights. This is Lori Ann Pesterbeck, teammate. Teammate, G yes. General, awesome, awesome person. And this is Sai Castells, also awesome person, also teammate. Sweet. I assume. We all assume awesomeness. And this is my lovely assistant, Skylar. Do you want to introduce yourself or no? You don't have to. Only if you want to. It's not going on the internet. Awesome audience members. Awesome audience members. Hooray! Yeah. The yeah. buzz! Yay. Oh, I forgot something. I'm operating a camera! Swip <laughs> <laughs> it around, get yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Camera Yay. people! <laughs> Shrug. Sorry, technical difficulties. Forgot the thing. Wait. Uh, where is the thing? Where is the it's thing? It's right here. I'm gonna check them uh, right. uh, We're finding the things. For those of you who don't know, Writing Nights has three, well, two and a half new t-shirts. <laughs> two and a half. <laughs> sure you are all familiar with the black Writing Nights shirts. <whistles> but now, there's, more. there's red. There's red. <whistles> and... There's blue. <gasps> oh my god. And what's on the back? There's Holy words. shit! <gasps> Shut on the back! Oh, Holy poetry. Holy poetry. <laughs> and on the black one as well. Because these are the old ones. These are the ones that just had the front on them. You had like 15 left. So all of you looking at this online can buy them at writingice.com. You said this wasn't going online. Well, not until after Friday. Okay. When did I say that? You said it wasn't going online. Watch what the video. There's proof. Okay. Not right now, no. Go ahead. Can we take a couple upstairs? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. We're just talking to the invisible people who wander around. <laughs> we steal our chairs. I'm sure there are the ghosts of many readers. Uh, hi. Apologies. The, uh, there are. Well, hopefully most of them have left living, so. Yeah, most of them. The uh, chair fairies. The chair fairies. <laughs> the cherries? Mmm, <laughs> cherries! Are we popping <laughs> the cherries? <laughs> Alright, um... I don't know that that's possible if they're incorporeal beings. That is true. We have to use Ghostbuster science. <laughs> Which exists, I think! Slimer and undone. <laughs> Slimer. <laughs> don't want to touch that one. That's a good day. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, should we start with uh, the National Ransom? Because that's kind of a good opening piece. I don't know where my folder is. Well, you mean the piece we didn't practice? Yeah, you know. We were supposed to practice and then yes. we didn't, and I don't know where the folder is. I think it's over here. Should I uh, 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 keep on recording? Yes. 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 This is very important. It should be recording. Just don't even worry about checking it out. So this is a piece that I've had rolling around for a while and never really gets good reaction, hopefully, with three people. Shall we? We shall. We shall. Oh, hey, can you see the minorities fight? For the rights cis white males cannot dream of not having, whose broad strokes and privilege make them blind to the plight. 
Inequality stricken, victim blaming, screaming, cops, shops, rips the air, John Q. Public don't care. The fags and the thugs don't deserve to be there. Oh, hey, does this national ransom get paid on the backs of the blacks with the blood of the braves? If you think that I'm wrong, get your head out the ground. One percenters are laughing as we're all falling down. Advertisements divide by the clothes that we wear, fill our heads with dumb shit celebritards that don't care. And reality shows, no reality shown, but the people still watch and the people get boned. Oh, hey, does this national ransom get raised from the citizens' souls and the minds over? Check your cash, you might not have enough. But the planet's resources can meet everyone's needs. We have houses for all, it don't have to be rough. But the planet's resources can't meet everyone's greed. We are sucking her dry, light pollution in the sky. If we don't change our ways, then we're all gonna die. The sky over national ransom is blazed. And the cancer kills us from We don't realize the roots of our problems is greed. Class system divides, leaves the poor on the streets. Single parents are blamed, they welfare for their needs, rules made against women's choices for their bodies. And the rockets spread blood, bury soldiers in mud. If they chance to survive, who cares, they were duds. Oh, oh hey, can this national ransom be waived? Take the power. From the rich, then we cease to be slaves. Play ball. <laughs> is that how it actually ends? Yeah. You say play ball? No, I mean, that's how I've been ending it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You should, then people will know it's over. Yeah. I like that. And then people can. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I dig the play ball at the end. Yeah. <laughs> kind of the, like mess with them, like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> so, let's go first. Since you have something right okay. there. I will. Alright, alright. Um I have a high note to work on okay. I'll start with a short one. Um, this is a this is a love poem for a person I love. You are my solar system, my soul insistence. Your eyes are moons, your limbs are trajectories of planetary fingers and toes. Your head is the universal connection with hair tendrils stretching light years. Your openings are black holes transforming chemicals with organic fusion, intense pressure and bending the space-time continuum to process drawing nutrients and spiritual energy. Your heart pushes the energy through I watch you orbit. You rotate on an axis of love, and you turn my life into something revolutionary. Next. I think it's amazing how um, much you write, and then how much you actually don't share or read out loud. <laughs> yep. Um, as so often happens. Um, you're like, wow, this is good, and then you don't share it with anyone. So I think this is the first time I'm actually reading this out loud. This has come to the table. If I invite you to the table, I will leave behind my gender, and you can leave behind your misogyny, your gender biases, your lack of belief in sexual fluidity, orientation, they all get left behind. If I invite you to the table, I will strip away my agnosticism. Your Christ and your Allah and your Buddha can all take a seat at the door. If I invite you to the table, forget money. It will not buy you a place. Leave your status, tax bracket, tucked inside your purses and wallets. It has no merit here. If I invite you to the table, come hungry. Where your scars and your hurts and your pains, where your hopes and ideals, leave every other man-made construct label that keeps us segregated far outside. Come to this table as a simple human being. 
bring you, your heart, your soul, bring your humanness, bring your skin, the original kaleidoscope of what this planet has created. We are all born helpless without knowledge of race, creed, God, hate. We are born blank slates. Let us come to the table as those blank slates. Let us see one another and rebuild our understanding of each other. Let us begin to talk of the healing that needs to happen. Over a meal, let us bond, let us celebrate this one life we have. Let us learn, let us grow. Come to the table. Thanks. This one's called The River You Cross. In the end, it's not the river you cross, but the river that crosses you. Or else, for a moment, you cross yourself, watching an earlier version walk by, frizzy-haired and stunted, lugging a satchel like a falling chain in 30 degrees, but no coat, because you hadn't yet learned how to dress, but insisted that nobody address you. After all, you weren't a child anymore, except that you were. You, you know that now. They all were, all of you, a river of children who think that they're not carrying the rafts of their hopes, bound to crash, every one of them, because they have no oars. They were cut from the dock, perhaps unfairly soon, and now they're a burden on the backs of these children who think they're not. The world ought to stop and wait for them to cross the street, because if a dream should crash into them, Lord knows they won't see it coming. <laughs> I was never really close with my actual grandparents, so um, I kind of adopted one of my high school girlfriend's grandmother. Um, so uh, she recently passed away. Um, I wrote a poem for her about five years ago, and then nothing ever else about her until January when I learned that she was terminal and she was pretty much on her way out. So I'm going to read them as one and two. Um, the only difference in their cover, color, uh, title, the only difference in their title, is, uh, one says, to grandma, I love you, and the other is, to grandma, thank you, so. A cooling late September day, a feisty old woman losing her mind with boredom and despair, colostomy bag, both breasts biopsied, a lifetime of pain, joys, sorrows, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, a fortune teller once informed her she would have the will to survive until her children and grandchildren no longer needed her. Unfortunately, with such codependence surrounding her, she's bound to live forever. I enter her house. The first smell is animal shit of a non-specific creature. I see a bunny. A little boy calls himself Spider-Man to my girlfriend. It's cute. He looks exactly like his father, who is nowhere to be found today. Puppies play outside. We enter the main part of the trailer where the old woman sits in her chair, old with grooves, worn in from decades of use. When I first met her, she was already old. I was dating her granddaughter. She caught us literally with our pants down once. But now she's not as mobile. She can't even stand as I enter, but I hug her. We talk about her problems briefly. We talk about my poetry and publishing. She tells me again the story of how she was reading my first book before her granddaughter ran off with it. That reminds me of my new book, and I grab a copy from the car. I sign the back. To Grandma, I love you. She doesn't read the book right away, but tears start rolling down her cheeks. It might be bittersweet, but I like to think I have been able to bring a bit of light into her darkening life. At last, I can't stand the smell, and my girlfriend and I have an elsewhere to be. We stand. Grandma stands shakily. We hug tightly as possible. We share a few more words. We hold hands. Then another hug before slowly slinking out of the house with a promise of a Thanksgiving visit. Two. An unseasonably warm January, a feisty woman wished she could find the strength to no longer be afraid and let go. She's too far gone to be bored now and wants everyone to be okay without her. I wonder if she remembered the fortune teller in her last moment, the one who told her she would survive until her family no longer needed her. I tell her granddaughter, my first real girlfriend, that she knew you loved her, and she loved you with her entire being. You were why she hung on as long as she did. If she is gone, she knew that you were ready to face life without her. 
I'm at work with a malfunctioning internet. But this break in action allows me a chance to reflect on this, the first poem I've written in a, this year. I reflect on the last time I saw her, gravity glued to her hospital bed. When I last saw her, so many new beginnings surrounded her. The granddaughter she loved with her being granddaughter she loved with her being had a potential new love. The two-year-old child clung to each of them who would squeal with delight of life every couple of minutes. I couldn't hug her because I was afraid of her frailty, but the last kiss I gave her on her forehead whispered that she didn't have to be afraid. The only thing awaiting her was peace. That was exactly seven days ago. The last time I saw her on her feet, she stood to hug me about a year ago while I visited. She was still feisty then, but the world weighed upon her. I've made the perfunctory internet status posts of rest in peace, and people say they are sorry. I don't dismiss their thanks, I just ask them not to be. I'm not sorry she's gone. I'm glad she's no longer in pain, and that she was in my life. I'm secretly glad she is at peace, whatever is waiting for her in the beyond or the ecosystem. I hope that when it comes my time, I am sent into the beyond or the ecosystem to the sounds of children squealing with the light of life. Next. Um, so the other thing I learned is I'm not a performance poet, and writing performance poetry is hard and sucks. Um, <laughs> when you expect your reader to read fancy things on the page and draw inspiration and imagery and like uh, fancy catchphrases and like a Don Quixote thrown in here and Hemingway there, and you 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 know it's it's like intellectual stew on a page. And then when you have to perform, you perform in front of people who are like, oh, this and oh, that, and you're like, oh, shoot, I gotta bring a game. Um, <laughs> and it's been driving me crazy because that angst that I once had that used to fill poetry is gone. I'm not angsty anymore. Yay, no more 90s. But <laughs> when you change, your poetry changes. And so trying to write something to bring something forward just came out. I am your token sucker mom. This is a label that was placed upon me, not one I particularly care for. You wear your labels like a shield, a badge of honor, grabbing some, accepting some, discarding others, applying them, peeling them, sticking <coughs> sticking them to your withered carcass, and proclaiming, look, here I am. And then what? And then what? When the years go by and you age, you age out and move on, you reaffix, readhesive, Pale, paste, cut, trim, design new ones. You see, I had labels. I was a failure. I was a disappointment. I was knocked up too early, too soon. I was uncareful. I was scared. I was constantly told, you better not mess up again, young lady. Every step along my path, in the back of my head, I knew I had two paths to take. I could be their label, or I could be my own. When I was 18, I sat in the WIC office with my newborn son. And this older lady across from me says to me, oh, honey, are you here with me first? And I said, yes, my first and only. And she laughed and she said, oh no, you'll be here again next year with another one. You wait and see. And her daughter and her grandchildren were there. Three little ones running around and a fourth one in the oven from a girl who looked no older than I was. Four kids by 18? Oh God, no, she had to be older. Please tell me she was older. And I looked at that fate and I said, Fuck, no, this is not for me. I don't want to be here. I didn't plan to be here. I didn't let myself be here. And now I'm going to tell myself, I'm going to go somewhere else. I would not be here again next year. No, no, this is not me. So I wore the badge of single mom proudly. I got food stamps as I plowed through six years of school, got my master's degree. I was a single mom, a graduate degree holder. I am a woman in philosophy. I was poor then, making $12 an hour with 50 grand in student loans. More labels put upon me. I was their labels, I was my labels, I was difficult and headstrong, I was get on my bandwagon or get the fuck out of my way. But I am a success story. There's another label I finally apply and I will wear proudly. I am a success story. I met a great guy, I got married, I had a baby. Sixteen years later, after I sat in that wig office with my pride and my ego in my lap, I had my second baby. I have a good job at a good company, I teach, I write, I am on the stage in front of you spitting out my life story because this story is more than my label. When you have based your writings upon all the emotion 
and drama and failures and successes, trials and disappointments, hurts and heartaches, when you are here, when it all goes right and you are right here, what do you write about? I write about wishing for my grown son to know passion from someone who loves him. Passion without heartbreak, unconditional love from someone who's not blood. I write of my baby's blue eyes and the difficult world she has ahead of her. I write just to write, and I watch these performances, and I hear these pieces, I hear your pieces, and I hear the anger, and I see the scars, and I watch the blood, and I get here, and, and I just appear to be your token soccer mom. And I tell you, you are more than your label. She was the one who shaved her head that yep. year on mm -hmm. stage. Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> See, I think the two of you get along very well. Yeah. Yeah, I think about that performance every time I write something and I go, oh, man. How do you, how do you top that? How do you top that? <laughs> I was just thinking. <laughs> <of myself. laughs> and now, if I can get it read, like, without shaking in under three minutes, it's golden. Mm -hmm. Chaos. That comes next. Well. Write first, then then write for slam. Can't slam something that ain't written. Well, I like that. Word. When Asriel uh, read a poem about a death, uh, I had already selected this one to be next. This is called When I Die. When I die, I will not be gone. I will be more here than I have ever been before. All my life I have lived halfway in the past, everything clouded by the meanings my memories ascribed, and halfway in the future, inventing plans and fears as an excuse not to get too invested in this exact, this most real and present now. When I die, it will be the end of time for me, the end of regret, the end of fretting over ticking seconds, the end of punctuality, and the end of the need to be ready and waiting. The end of the stalking, menacing approach of the trauma haze that follows each event like the wake left by ships in the sea. I will be calm for the first time, relaxed. The tension will finally let up and I'll be. I will rest my eyes from looking and my feet from running. I will rest inside my bones and skin. I'll rest inside my finally silent brain. Its neurons no longer burning them themselves with those electric chemical fires. They'll be dark and cool, a forest after flames. And in that quiet, I may finally hear the lovely sound that my heart's incessant beat has so far drowned out. The sound of the life I've been dying to live. Um, okay. More death. Uh, uh, I used to Well, work. now I know how you top shaving your head on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, as, just as a Grim Reaper. Um, okay, so I used to work at a chicken processing plant. As a guard, like I was a security guard. Um, so this is where this from. The guard shack is a poultry bird. Wings wide, air moving through. We do not fly. We are the sentinels of the nightly, daily, week-long, repetitious, foul holocaust. My only consolation is not observing the mechanical destruction of genetically manipulated food. Their only consolation is their ignorance of what the outside world could hold. The occasional escapee experiences tiny freedom before being captured by the ones just doing their job. My reverence is my apology. Thank you for your sacrifices. Their comfort is someone paying an attention which doesn't lead to decapitation. I whistle to them and they chirrup back at me. We all miss the message. I don't speak chicken. They don't speak hypocrite. Uh, shoot, man, shoot. Right. Uh, yes, actually. No pressure. <sighs> that was close. <laughs> Our only time limit is 8.45.
Do you have yours ready? <coughs> yes. Yes, go ahead. It must be. So I'm kind of both a theist and an atheist at the same time most of the time. Uh, You're a quasi-theist? Something like that. I think I think I could probably claim that okay, if I wanted to. Uh, Pseudo-theist. Semi-theist? Semi-theist. So this was a... This is my... My, one of my many atheist theist poems. I'm having trouble praying to a God that isn't real, yet still most days I feel the pain of silenced voice and must pray. I do not care whose deaf mythical ears will, will fail to catch and answer my plea. I do not care that my only comfort is from a trick of my placebo-addled animal brain. I must pray. To no one but my empty paper doll god, wind rattled and ink stained, and imagine a compassionate smile penciled on his pale flat front. And even in my self-deluded mystic mind, I know my words are wind on a mountainside, except much more impotent. They are a paper doll blown by the storm, without even beauty to give it any worth. Still I must pray, and write my wishes on the wind. So that when a sweet breath of good fortune comes, I may have just enough presence of mind to say thank you to no one. So I met a guy once at a uh, poetry event at Open Mic who dared ask me the following question. Are you a real poet? He stopped me and asked me, are you a real poet? What does that mean, am I a real poet? I can pinch myself here on the stage for you if you'd like. Yeah, ow, pain. Empirical evidence that yes, indeed, I am real. We could wax philosophically heavily at that. I do have an advanced degree in the field, after all. We could argue Descartes to be, to exist. Damn, what was that quote again? What do I call myself? Maybe you should question whether or not I'm a real philosopher. Am I a real poet? Am I a real woman? I've never been asked that before. How do you respond? What quip of the tongue witty remark toward criticism do you just spout out after being asked that? Maybe it was the hair, the outfit. I bet it was the lipstick that made him have to reach out and ask. Maybe pretty words can't come from a pretty tongue. But I don't consider myself pretty, so there blows that theory. Are you a real poet? What the fuck, man? Was Poe a real poet? Dickinson? How about the ones who lie in their graves, never seeing their words printed, never folding their own books, scouring the pages, smelling the ink, decorating the cover, inscribing their name on the inside of that first edition to some heady fan who goes, oh my god, I think you're the best ever. Yeah, my valley girl just came out. But I'd yet to speak before he asked me those words, so I know there was no sweet valley high overheard to question my ability. But what does that mean? Are you a real poet? Who gives someone a license that says, yes, real poet, come on board, we'll bump you up from coach to first class, because gosh darn it, you know what, you're a real poet. <laughs> I'm sure he meant no harm, no offense. Maybe he just liked taking a woman off guard, which makes me wonder how many others before me he had asked that same question to, and whether or not he would walk up to a man and ask, hey, hey stud, are you a real poet? <laughs> are you a real poet? What does that mean? You know, I don't have the slightest clue what the correct answer to that question is, other than the fact that, hell yes, I am a real poet. I am flesh and blood. I can write some good shit on a page. I can use some swear words to make myself stuff stronger. Although most times my stuff is pretty clean and a little prude, but very pretty, because I pride myself on the imagery, not so much the sharp blows of content. Yes, I am a real poet. And I'd like to think I'm a pretty damn good one, so thank you, sir, for giving me fuel to fire what I know, what I hope will one day be one fucking fantastic performance piece that maybe someday you'll be there when I read this and we'll have a good laugh and you'll go you know I didn't really mean that and I'll be like hey you know what because I really don't give a shit <laughs> I got my own answer and hell I even got a poem out of it to boot so how about them apples <laughs> hell yes I am a real poet nice. <laughs> wait am I what am I a real poet yeah anybody who reads and writes is a real poet. Okay. I'm not a real anything. 
I'm real, but the gender binary doesn't exist. What about a real uh, uh, poet, a uh, laureate? <laughs> that could be a pun on her name, too. <laughs> Or a uh, poet lasso, uh, poet uh, lariat. Hey. <laughs> that sounds kinky. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ask Wonder Woman. I haven't seen that yet. Is that a good movie? Haven't seen it either. No, I love the comic books though. Like they're uh, really well written right now. Yeah. All right, so Sai did a uh, atheist theist poem. So I'm not exactly an atheist. I'm more like on the other spectrum of polytheist, but um, sometimes religion pisses me off. Um, all right, anyway, this the poem explains what happens. Um, it was love, maybe. It was at least like and a dual tolerance and certainly attraction. A connection, if you will, that in our prehistoric times might have brought them together without much more formality or bureaucracy. Enter overbearing political religion, bent on controlling what goes into and what comes out of a woman's body, despite her wishes. Enter close-mindedness, which shut the door afterward to a devout follower, someone who sought refuge and sanctuary from a place of worship. Enter someone who tried to reconcile her religious beliefs with her basest human instincts. A religion that espouses unconditional love, then excuses its followers from applying it by saying that humans aren't perfect, so screw you, hippie, da darky, faggy Muslim. You can't possibly be a good person if you don't believe in my God. Then things happened. Things she never thought could happen so naturally, so naturally that doctors told her it never could. But it did, and she's happy for a moment. Until political religion overbears on her newly bearing surprise, a child conceived like Jesus out of wedlock. Like Jesus, who hung out with and loved whores, Mary Magdalene, anyone? Adulterers, thieves, transgender, and gay people. Fun fact, Matthew 19, 12. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's wombs. Eunuchs in this instance refers to gay men. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Fun fact, Luke 22.10, he replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. It was culturally a woman's job to carry jars of water. Who else but a male presenting as a woman to be carrying a jar of water? Fun fact, Jesus wasn't born on Christmas. But facts will never <laughs> appeal to the fiction-fattened, imperfect hypocrites who badger this young woman and her partner. Sure, the guy wasn't God, but who is nowadays? <laughs> I guess I shouldn't be surprised by a religion that cherry-picks the parts of its holy book which feed their narrative until the overweight bastard blobs its way through history, eating folk culture traditions like Easter eggs, picking its teeth with Christmas trees. She sought acceptance. Chances are, she was so overjoyed by the unexpected happening that she didn't even think to feel guilty. For shame. How dare she follow her heart or her body or her sensibilities in bodily autonomy? How dare she have sex before marriage? Her name isn't Mary, after all. <laughs> and his name wasn't Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah, Buddha, Shiva, or Satan. He was just a man, doing what some men do. She was just a woman, doing what she wanted with her 